So the quality gap is defined to be that we know that d star at best can be equal to p star, right? So g is greater than equal to 0 and this quantity g is called duality gap, right? And let us look at one example where we see this kind of duality gap. Uh, so yeah, before that let me just uh, summarize this. So we have the primal, we had the pri primal problem to start with which was this particular problem, right? And the equivalent dual uh, problem is, so the Lagrangian dual problem would be, so d star which is defined to be the optimal value of So this is the uh, the Lagrangian dual problem, okay? And we know that it's always concave. This particular optimization, like g lambda nu, is always going to be concave, even if the uh, original functions are non-convex, okay? So let's look at an example where you actually see the duality here. So example of duality here. Where even if like I mean every constraint and everything those are convex, but they still see the duality gap. No, no, just lambda for the inequality constraint. So as I, as we saw here, right? Like if we look at the lower bound property, I mean this is anyway equal to zero. We just needed lambda to be greater than or equal to zero so as to. And nu cannot be zero, right? Because let's say, I mean as I said, the vectors are going to be collinear. So, if you make them 0, then you are saying that the vectors are in fact 0, then it becomes a, an unconstrained minimization, right? Okay, it can be negative, yes. I mean, if the vector, let, let us say this constraint set here over here, right? If it actually, I mean, it's, it does not grow out, it basically decreases out, I mean, as you go outwards, then the vector gradient of b of x would be pointing inwards, right? So, then in that case, it will be negative. Okay, so it really depends on the function that you are working with. I mean, if I if I represent the equality constraint as b minus bx instead of bx minus b, then I mean it, it flips the sign, right? Because it is equality, so I can write it both ways. So let us say your x is in R2. So you want to minimize e to the x2 subject to 2 norm of x less than or equal to x1, okay? So what does the constraint set look like here? We say that a 2 norm of less is uh, 2 uh, x is less than or equal to 1. What is the 2 norm of x? So let us, so the constraint sets are of this form x1, x2 such that x1 square plus x2 square is less than or equal to x1, right? So when can this be true? Yeah. So, this is essentially when x1 is greater than or equal to 0 and x2 is equal to 0, okay? That is the, that's the only way this can be true, right? Okay? So, when x2 equal to 0, what is the value of this function? e to the 0 is 1, right? And no matter what your x, I mean what like what your x1 is, this will always be 1. So, the primal objective value is? Okay. So for, I mean in fact, yeah, so this is the primal objective value is 1, okay. Is this clear? So let us look at the dual, uh, dual object, dual optimal value. So primal optimal is P star, we know it is, it is 1. So in this case, we have G lambda, lambda is going to be scalar because it is just one inequality constraint and there is no equality constraint, so we just have g lambda and that is defined to be okay. 
lambda times h of x less than or equal to 0 is the constraint right. So, what is h of x? Okay. Is this clear? And what is f of x here? e to the x 2. We know that e to the x 2 no matter what your x 2 is always greater than or equal to 0. What about this? Is this quantity always greater than or equal to 0? Yes, right. So, this is always greater than or equal to 0 and the dual optimization problem is you maximize g lambda subject to lambda greater than or equal to 0. So, one thing that we know is d star is greater than or equal to 0. Why? Because d star by def definition is maximize over lambda greater than or equal to 0 g lambda and from here we know that g lambda is greater than or equal to 0. So, d star is always greater than or equal to 0 ok. So, that is one, one condition that we have. Is this clear? All right. I mean we still have not proved or like one way or the other whether there exists a duality gap or not right. Maybe d star is greater than equal to 0 if maybe d star is equal to 1 right. So, in that case there is no duality gap as of now we have not said that there is a I mean we have not shown that there is a duality gap in this problem. So, we still need to find what d star is ok. So, let us define this function which basically is this particular function over here. So, this is nothing but which is going to be x 2 square So, you just multiply with the conjugate of this term in the numerator and the denominator and that is what you get right ok. And if you choose then you can show that this particular term is sim is upper bounded by this particular thing. I mean just simple algebra just substitute x 1 to be x 2 to the power 4 you can show that this is this eta term is upper bounded by 1 over x 2 square and as x 2 goes to negative infinity basically this this particular term goes to 0 right as x 2 goes to negative infinity. Okay. So, what was the definition of, uh, so what is the definition of g lambda? So, g lambda is defined to be minimum of x in R 2 e to the x 2 plus lambda times this particular term eta x 1 x 2 right. That is the definition of g lambda. Now, this is going to be like, so I am doing this minimization over the entire of R 2 right. If I did I if I restrict this over a smaller like a subset of R 2 then that particular minimum is going to be greater than this minimum. Let us say if I try to minimize x square a function x square over the interval 1 to 3 the value of x square is the minimum value that of x square that I can get is 1. But if I try to minimize the same function s square over the entire R the minimum value is 0 right. So, if you the moment you minimize it is over a smaller set that minimum value is go always going to exceed the one that we so essentially if I try to minimize it over this set ok and as x 2 goes to negative infinity this particular term goes to 0 because e to the negative infinity is 0. We have already shown that this goes to 0 along this particular line along this particular uh, constraint set. So, that means g lambda is less than or equal to 0 along this set and the maximum of this also is going to be less than. So, d star is going to be less than or equal to 0 ok. So, the maximum of g lambda is also going to be less than or equal to 0. So, d star is going to be less than or equal to 0. And if I look at the previous const constraint that I have obtained on d star it was that d star is greater than or equal to 0. 
So the only way this is possible is that d star is equal to 0. So from these two uh, constraints I obtain that d star is equal to 0 meaning uh, the duality gap g which is p star minus d star that is equal to 1 which is greater than 0. So this is I mean there exists so this is a I mean basically this formulation is uh, I mean you have a weak duality here it is not strong duality because the duality gap is strictly greater than 0 ok. So this is an example of a problem where you see the duality gap and in that case I mean when you solve the dual problem you only get an approximate solution not a not the exact solution right of the original problem that you wanted to solve. In cases when the duality gap is 0 uh, that is when you can hope to find uh, uh, like that is when you can actually find the exact solution to the same problem primal problem in a much simpler manner and we are now going to look at constraints under which uh, the strong duality holds. Is this clear? This one? So we know that d of lambda is less than or equal to this term and as x2 goes to negative infinity this goes to 0, e to the negative infinity also goes to 0. So this is 0 like the minimum of this is also going to be 0. So g of lambda is less than or equal to 0 and then now if you maximize g of lambda because this is true for any lambda right. So if you maximize this uh, with respect to lambda that is also going to be less than or equal to 0 and therefore d star is less than or equal to 0 ok. So we have obtained that I mean this is basically there exists duality gap right in this problem. For the remainder of the lecture we will focus on uh, basically looking at conditions under which strong duality holds. Because here from here we know that d star is less than or equal to 0 right and earlier when we looked at the definition of g lambda we obtained that d star is greater than or equal to 0. So the only way both can be true is when d star is exactly equal to 0 ok. So now we are going to look at conditions under which strong duality holds. So that means the duality gap g is equal to 0 or p star is equal to d star. So we look at something called Slater's condition which says that so if there exists an x bar or which is strictly feasible. What do we mean by strict feasibility? That means for every inequality constraint it is it actually satisfied with uh, strict inequality ok. So Slater condition says that if you are able to find an x bar such that the inequality constraints are strict ok. If you are able to find one such x bar then under the assumptions that we looked at that so what were the assumption here? So assumptions was that these functions are convex and p star is finite under this assumption. So let us call these assumptions star. So then assumption star plus strict feasibility So this implies strong duality. So in the previous example was there a strict feasibility? I mean the duality gap was there so it was not uh, I mean it was not the case of strong duality right and if I look at all the set of feasible points. So x2 equal to 0 in fact I mean it is not possible to have a strict feasibility right. We cannot have a point which is strict I mean which is entirely in the interior of x. This point because of x2 equal to 0 it lies at the boundary right. So there is I mean we do not have strict feasibility here so the Slater condition Slater's condition are not met and therefore we cannot have strong duality I mean we, we cannot conclude that way it is it's, 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 it's a sufficient condition but uh, the fact that we did not have a strong duality that in itself tells you that. Uh, you would not have strict feasibility in the first place. 
So under this assumption star and strict feasibility, you would always have strong duality. So that's the status condition. And just a quick remark. So this requirement for strict feasibility, it's there when you have non-linear inequality constraints. For linear inequality constraints, uh, you always have a strong duality. Yeah, just one point. So something that must exist in the interior of the set. So for linear inequality constraints, strong duality holds even without strict feasibility. So as long as you have linear equality constraints, uh, I mean you would have strong duality. But for in general non-linear inequality constraints, you would want them to hold with like you, you basically want them to be like or you want the status condition to hold true. So that means you should be able to find a strictly feasible point. And as long as you are able to do so, you can guarantee strong duality. And what are the consequences of strong duality? I mean something that we already looked at. So if, if uh, a strong duality holds, that means uh, we can work with dual optimization problem, right? Can work with dual optimization problems. So something that we haven't looked at is a KKT condition, something which, you, which we are going to look at in the subsequent lectures. But if strong duality holds, then KKT conditions which are always sufficient also become necessary. So KKT conditions become if and only if kind of conditions under strong one. I mean we haven't specified what KKT conditions are and I mean you don't have to worry about it for now. But then uh, something that we are going to look at in the subsequent lectures, okay. So again for strong duality to hold for in I mean status condition are sort of sufficient condition. So if you are able to find strictly feasible point, you can guarantee for sure that strong duality holds. And for linear inequality constraints you don't even have to do anything. I mean there you there I mean there will be an equivalent dual formulation by itself as long as this assumption star is there, okay. Any questions on this? So what is the geometric meaning of Lagrange multipliers or the dual variable? Or not geometric meaning but like in general how should you interpret uh, dual variables? So particularly again when we look at the equality constraint problem, so this particular example that we looked at which was minimize f of x, x in Rn subject to some equality budget constraint, right. So what is the meaning of, so we get some new star right which is the dual variable corresponding to this particular equality constraint. But what, what is the, an intuitive understanding of this particular uh, dual variable. So let's write down the Lagrangian and Lagrangian turns out to be f of x plus nu times okay and the constraints are or like I mean if we basically now I mean there, so this basically becomes an unconstrained optimization problem. So the first order condition for optimality is the gradients must vanish both with respect to x and nu. So this basically gives you that bx star is equal to b, why? why? Because the gradient with respect to nu should be 0 and the other constraint is nu 
menu start. Okay. So let us say uh, m star is the optimal value. Okay, it's the optimal value of this objective function f of x that you are trying to minimize subject to this constraint. So m star by definition is f of x star because it's the optimal value and x star is the optimal solution which is because of the this particular constraint here this is nothing but l of x star nu star right okay is this clear by the way if i change my budget i know that my x star and nu star the these points are also going to vary right as i vary my budget little b so you should really view x star as a function of b and likewise nu star as a function of b because if you change your uh, budget b that you have under which you are operating that that is also going to vary your optimal solution ok. So, let us see what this looks like. So, how does so the question is uh, so now we are going to study how does this particular uh, optimal value changes as my change my budget ok. So, this is this is the derivative that I am going to evaluate. So, if I am going to be changing my budget my optimal solution is going to be varying. And why? Because these are also going to be function of b. So, this by definition is d ok. This total derivative is uh, partial partial b ok. Is this clear? So, what is this quantity partial L partial x at, at x star? So, what is the first order condition for optimality? The gradient must vanish at x star and, lambda and nu star right. So, this is equal to 0 and this is equal to 0. And what is partial L partial b? So, the derivative derivative of this with respect to b is negative nu star which is your dual variable right. So, so really like the way you should interpret uh, this dual variable is as an incremental cost variable. So, as you change your budget how does your optimal solution vary? So, the rate of it is what this Lagrange this dual variable captures. So, this is also sometimes called incremental cost variable. Okay. So, your Lagrange multiplier nu star turns out to be dm like this derivative of an optimal solution with respect to ok. Is this clear to everyone? All right. So, now uh, we will conclude this uh, with an example where we would try and convert a primal form to a dual form. So, so we started with this particular problem minimize So, this is the primal form. You also assume that q is invertible. So, q is positive definite ok. So, does so first of all does the strong dual, does strong duality hold here right. I mean what kind of constraints are these linear inequality constraints right. So, strong duality always holds. So, and if q is positive definite this function is convex. So, these assumptions also hold. So, that means uh, like the strong basically this strong duality holds right. So, we do not have to look for strictly feasible x as long as it is linear inequality constraint. So, that means in the dual objective value would be same as the primal objective value. So, first thing that we should notice is that strong duality holds. P star turns out to be D star 
So now we will try and convert this to a dual optimization problem. Okay. So we need to Okay, is this clear? So now this becomes an unconstrained optimization problem in X in order to be able to find G lambda, right? Okay, so how do we solve for this? How do we find G lambda? So we have to minimize this particular function. And what is like if it's an unconstrained minimization, what, what is the criteria to minimize with respect to X? Just set the derivative with respect to X and set it to zero, right? Take the derivative and set it to zero. So what is the derivative with respect to X? qx plus c transpose lambda that should be equal to 0 right. So x star in because q is positive definite so this is invertible. Okay. Now you substitute the value of x star and everything would be in terms of lambda like basically lambda right because this is defined only for minimum and you can verify I will just write down the solution uh, you can verify this turns out to be uh, so the equivalent g lambda which turns so this g lambda turns out to be negative lambda transpose p lambda minus a transpose lambda where uh, where this matrix p is defined to be something that you can verify. So I'm not going to be deriving that. Okay. So so this is your dual problem, and we know that dual function is always concave function, right? So if Q is positive definite, Q inverse is also positive definite. So this p turns out to be positive, like negative semi-definite at least, right? And that which which is basically your concave function. So this is always concave function, and we look at the max so maximization of this, completely defined in terms of lambda, right? And since it's defined in terms of lambda, now and like if I look if I look at the problem that we started with. Which was, which is this particular problem, right? And we are, we were looking at the constraint when n is very large and r is very small. Everything is defined in terms of lambda, which is in r dimensional, right? And it's much easier to solve. Every agent can solve it locally, and then you can use uh, can use this particular constraint to evaluate. Once they have once they have agreed upon a common lambda, then they can simply solve for this, right? And find the x star. So this is this is a very sort of neat way to work with a reduced order problem. Also, the constraints that are going that you are going to be working with is much simpler than ax less than or equal to b, right? It's just lambda greater than or equal to zero. So working with dual problems in certain cases turns out to be much easier than working with primal problem. And this is something that we are also going to be looking at when we so remember in one of the lectures we looked at the mathematical formulation of support vector machines, and we looked at the primal form. We are going to look at the dual form and then we are going to see how it also helps with implement implementing the kernel SVM, something that uh, that is often used in machine learning. So yeah, with this I would like to end uh, today's lecture unless there are any more questions.